Okay, so uh, it's a great opportunity. First of all, I've had a lot of fun. This is a, a great uh, summer school, especially the hackathon has been awesome, as you will see in some pictures later on. It's wonderful that I can present in two days because um, I think in graphs, and then it can be applied to many different things. My main area is memory and planning. And so all of those things that Jeremy said, it can just come down to how do we use the past to predict and plan the future. That's the overall thing that I care about. Now, this can be inside one person's brain. It can be in groups of people and collectives and uh, applied to different levels. OK, in this talk, I will just talk a little bit about graph theory. I'll skim over it, but I'll immediately jump into how that um, helps us to design experiments and study predictive representations in the brain and replay in particular, which is something that I'm very um, uh, active in. And uh, then I will talk a little bit about uh, some big picture wrap up and um, I'll make some bold claims and anyone who can provide good counter arguments, I'll buy them a drink. <laughs> okay, so day one is gonna be about cognitive maps, going back to one of my academic heroes, Tolman, that as you will see later, I kind of disagree with some of the aspects of his work. Um, and I will talk about uh, sort of uh, three main studies and one ongoing study, but mostly two of them, to be honest, because we don't have that much time, where I use different kinds of MDPs or Markov decision processes, which have a graph structure of designing your experiments in order to test different kinds of representations in the brain. Tomorrow, I'll talk about different kinds of network structure in two studies that I did with networks of people talking to each other and how the structure or the temporal dynamics of the networks shapes their collective memory. All right, so graphs are everywhere. Um, if you start thinking in terms of graphs, uh, it's, you, you, you cannot stop thinking about things in terms of graphs, as people have seen within the past couple of days. Um, they have different structures that are nicely identifiable, so it's easier with, when you think about uh, the world in terms of graphs to think about different structures and compare how different conditions um, happen under different structures. For instance, you could have a grid, you could have a ring, you could have a tree or a star. And um, in one of our studies, for instance, I compared networks that are clustered or non-clustered of individuals and how, uh, in which one they will agree more uh, about what happened, something that they commonly experienced, meaning they had more convergent collective memories than the other. Um, I, one of my favorite studies that recently came out was from the Spears Lab, and they had a wonderful way of uh, sort of describing very basic properties of graphs. So graphs are basically, a, a, a graph can be defined in terms of a number of vertices or just nodes and a number of edges that is between them. These edges can be directed or undirected and they can have a weight, so they can be weighted or not. They can ha all have the same weight. And uh, the number of vertices and the number of edges would be um, sort of uh, one of the characteristics, but there are other characteristics. You could measure for nodes, for edges, and for graphs, different notions of centrality. For instance, in this case, centrality of a particular uh, vertex or node would be defined in terms of all of its degrees. So you can have in degrees, you can have out degrees, and um, you can figure out a node centrality. Uh, you can also have other notions of centrality. So if you have that sort of graph, as uh, the Java D et al. paper from the Spears lab shows, if on the same graph, you can have different notions of centrality. Uh, so you can have degree centrality, as you see on the top, where it just tells you which uh, nodes are attached to more things, or have more neighbors. And then you have closeness centrality, which is the sum of the lengths of shortest paths between two nodes. So for instance, if you want to see, um, you just basically, as you can see down there, um, you're just um, averaging at the end of the day the number of shortest paths between, the, between them. And it's a, not a bad measure of um, how close two things are to each other as opposed to how far they are with each other. So the number of shortest paths would be sort of, um, the shortest path lengths would be way further if they are far, so it's very intuitive. And you have between the centrality, which is the number of shortest paths that pass through a particular node or edge. And this is very useful for clustering networks as we will see in a couple of slides. Two of my favorite kinds of centrality are eigenvector centrality and cut centrality. Eigenvector centrality is basically um, the idea of the influence of some edge, meaning it's not, it doesn't have a high necessarily sort of degree centrality. It's not itself connected to a lot of other nodes, but it's connected to nodes that are connected to a lot of other nodes. So if it spreads some information, the other nodes, a lot of nodes would receive it, not because it itself has a lot of neighbors, but because its neighbors are extremely uh, well connected. 
So that's a very important one. And PageRank and Cat Centrality, you know, Larry Page from Google, that most of what happens on your Google search and Google map, they started off with some, uh, with figuring out these notions of centrality or similar notions to that for web pages then. How many links are there to a particular web page? Um, that would uh, sort of determine its page rank. Then there's the cat centrality, my, my most favorite one of them, uh, developed in 1953, which is the relative degree of influence of a node within a network. What does that mean? It's the total number of walks between node pairs. So uh, with the sort of the GraphSemNet team, um, we have sort of discussed this a little bit. There can be different ways that on a particular graph, two nodes could um, reach each other. There are different paths that they could reach each other. And uh, a cat centrality takes into con consideration uh, the total number of walks that exist between node pairs. And so it's not just the direct connection between them. It's not just the shortest paths. It's the total number of possible walks that happen between them. So um, in my research, I look at how, for instance, the hippocampus might be representing the expected number of visitations of another state when you're in a given state, which means how many different ways in the way that the structure of the world is organized as a graph how many different ways will I have to reach from the state that I am right now to a particular given state that is way away from me or close regardless, right? And we can see that there is different time scales to take it back a little bit to, um, to Chris's work that uh, sort of uh, we could talk about these things. Um, so remember I talked a little bit about edge betweenness, which is an edge that if you take a lot of random walks uh, of shortest paths between different nodes, you would pass through this, this edge a lot will have a high edge betweenness. A number of different edges can have the same edge betweenness. So in one of my favorite algorithms for community detection and graphs, where you can just find clustering and communities, what happens is that you basically do the simple thing of you compute the edge betweenness with whatever method you want to do, and then uh, you remove the edges with the highest score and you do it again. So it gives you a way of hierarchically, hierarchically clustering different sort of communities within that. So from something like that on the A, you reach something in the bottom, which is B. Now, both in cat centrality and in what you see up there, I think that our team can recognize the, the sigma alpha to the L because that's very similar to a lot of different notions uh, or a lot of different equations that you will make where you want to measure how many different ways would two nodes get connected. So it's very closely related to cat centrality and to the successor representation. That I'll tell you a little bit later. And that sort of uh, I minus alpha um, adjacency matrix inverse, you will, re you will see this again. So just like, keep it in mind. It might not make sense right now. But at the infinite limit, if you add all of the different sort of multiplications of the adjacency matrix, which the first one gives you edges that are one away, multiplying a ma matrix by itself gives you edges that are two steps away. Three gives you uh, this paths that are three steps away. And we will do this in the lab tomorrow. Uh, when you go, when you take that to the infinite, uh, then uh, it converges to the equation that is um, up there. Okay, so now there are different kinds of network organizations or graph structures, and you can measure different parameters and vary them in order to figure out these different kinds of organizations. And examples of questions that you could ask, so you could have the randomness of it, uh, you could have regular graphs, you could have small world graphs, uh, you, would, you, ha you would have heard about it from the watson um, uh graphs. And, and, uh, Duncan Watts is now at Microsoft and he has this whole project that he works with, um, collective behavior of human using, humans using these networks. And uh, you could ask different kinds of questions at different levels of explanations by taking into account the particular structure of a graph. You could ask, how does memory network or graph structure influence forgetting, which is what we're doing at the hackathon. Or you could ask, how does social, network, how does social network structure, the structure of your social network, influence the way that our memories would be similar or dissimilar? And um, we, to which we'll get tomorrow. So just a fair warning, if you get into these kinds of things, this is what happened at the hackathon within three days. One of the walls is basically renovated by the um, different kinds of uh, things that we're writing on. It's fun, and uh, it's, it's a very generative way of thinking about things. Um, the Java idea, I'll just to give you a kind of perspective of how this can be applied to space, for instance, uh, uses these different kinds of betweenness uh, centrality in order to see inside the brain how you, when you uh, sort of uh, think about different locations in London, you might be representing these things in, in the brain. I won't get into this, but I recommend taking a look at this paper. 
Um, now, in cognitive maps, which is my favorite thing, um, it's not, and goes back to Tolman, of course, again, who very cleverly called his paper cognitive maps in mice and men, not spatial maps. And a lot of people for a, for a couple of decades, they kept focusing on space. Now, unlike Chris, I don't think that it's either about space or time. I think it's about any relations of states, and then we can construct cognitive distance. I will get back to this later on. So the cognitive maps are not especially about space. They're not especially about time. They're just about forming relationships between states that you have encountered. This can be a social network of people. This can be a series of stimuli you see. This can be the relationship between certain concepts, or it can be relationships between uh, locations on a map. Now, these are only a number of studies, um, including a bunch of ours, that uh, have investigated different sort of um, depths and multi-step sort of uh, ways of thinking in terms of graphs, in particularly in memory and decision making. And so I'll get into the part uh, that I have contributed to a couple of these studies. So one of uh, the things that I told you about a couple of times, and I'll expand it a little bit more with matrices, is the success representation in learning and memory. So my basic question, like I said, in everything that I do is, how do memories and predictions arise from the same neural circuits? How do we use memories to plan and predict the future? And so this is in between different fields, but at the end of the day, the question is simple in spite of the fact that it's at the, over, uh, at the intersection of a number of fields. So um, I have a, I'm very sort of blessed with friends. Um, I, have a, I have a friend, Mani, who uh, I play music with, and I have a, play, a friend, Sarf, who makes delicious pesanjun, which is an Iranian dish with uh, pomegranates. If you ever have a friend, make them cook it for you. Um, so I have associated them very strongly over the years uh, with the kind of reward that I receive from them. Now, Mani lives in Brooklyn, and Sarv lives in Philly, and I'm in a very good location in Princeton because I can choose which way to go. But they're in opposite directions if you take NJ Transit or Amtrak, if it doesn't derail. <laughs> so I have associated Brooklyn with Mani. I know that Brooklyn leads to Mani, and I know that Philly leads to Sarv, and I know that they lead to, I know what they lead to, but do I make this further sort of multi-step association of associating Brooklyn with music and Philly with good food? That's the whole concept of successor representations that I'd like you guys to keep in mind. That the whole thing is about my friends and music, no. The whole thing is about multi-state predictions, predictive representations of what would follow a couple of steps down the road. Now, um, you can compute these things. You can compute at the moment every weekend. I can start thinking, should I go to Philly or should I go to New York? And then just roll out everything one by one. Um, or you can cache it. Like I can have cached predictive representations that Philly food, New York music. And uh, we will see that, uh, especially in planning problems, when the branching sort of possibilities, uh, or the, that, that's a tree, as you can see, a decision tree. As you have more and more and more options, it would become very hard that at the moment when you need to make a decision, or a line coming toward my way, I might be get eaten. I don't have time to roll out all of the possibilities of different paths to go. I need to run as fast as possible. So cache representations really help. Uh, in this case, it's uh, planning a map to reward. And uh, having a sub goal in the middle of the way that is multi-steps away also helps you reduce the number of steps that you have to uh, sort of roll out the possibilities in planning. So there are multiple ways in which this helps you at planning or decision time. Now, Peter Diane is one of my heroes who's happily living. And this image is not reflecting his age, but the fact that to me, he's like Yoda. And um, he had a paper in 1993 where he talks about uh, the successor representation as the appropriate generalization between states uh, that is determined by how similar their successors are, and uh, representations should follow suit. So, meaning, if, um, um, for instance, uh, Brooklyn leads to music, and Tehran leads to music, and uh, Kreuzberg in Berlin leads to music, I will have a similar representation of them because their sort of um, their um, successor state is similar to each other. So there is a way that representations start to resemble their successors. It's uh, a little uh, the opposite of what happens in genetics. It's like parents start looking like their children, if you, if you want to think about it in terms of like the sort of the um, graph theory. So the, the, you would look a little bit more like things that follow you, the representations. All right, so uh, the hypothesis that we started for the studies was we wanted to test this. Was it, does the brain cache multi-step dependencies as in the success representation? 
And just to uh, uh, have another thing, again, this would be familiar to the graph SAMnet people. As you can see, there are, there are uh, these gammas. So every step you have a little discount in terms of how similar the representations are to each other or how much there is a representation of a successor state. And when you have multi-steps away, this gamma gets sort of multiplied. So if you, ha if you build a machine, a reinforcement learning agent that needs to decide whether to go to Philly or Brooklyn, as most machines have to decide, you need to figure out um, uh, the, the more further away a successor state is, the more you have a discount. Gamma is between zero and one. So the further it is, the less sort of similar you're going to look like it, right? And changing this gamma, as we will see later, it would be the scale of generalization or the different scale of um, sort of compression in your representations. And as, I will, um, as it will become until the end of this uh, talk, I think that there's multi-scale representations in the brain. Um, I think it speaks to so, sort of work uh, by um, uh, other people too. All right, so um, what are the optimal cognitive maps? I wouldn't get into reinforcement learning. I hope that another mind uh, year there will be a whole reinforcement learning and decision making sort of uh, summer school. Um, I'm just gonna say something with a couple of emojis. So uh, model-based learning is a case where I have this huge matrix of how all the states one by one transition to each other, one step to one step. And at the moment of decision, as you can see, his eyes are widened. Like you have to just completely roll out all of the steps to sort of simulate entire trajectories and do value iteration to decide what is the optimal path to take. So as you can see, he looks a little stressed out. But then if you have a successful representation learner, you can use this kind of, you know, you can telescope into future states because you have cached these multi-state representations and you can kind of look cool and uh, relaxed. Um, so this is how it will go. This will do this, not for this branch, but for all the branches to figure out how to get to reward. This one can say, oh, I know, like approximately I can jump here and then from here I will figure something out because it has figured out sub goals previously that would lead it to reward. All right, now let's open the hood of the reinforcement learning agent and look at the matrices that are inside of its head. So uh, don't freak out about the matrix. Uh, uh, you have seen this uh, on, the, on the walls downstairs, similar things anyway. So, um, so if I turned all of these states that my, it was my, you know, the cities and my friends and the kind of reward and everything, if I turned everything into numbered nodes and I put these things, it's the same representation, right? Now let's make a matrix representation of this. So, and uh, let's be just like, for the simplicity, I'm not gonna put probabilistic sort of uh, tra probability of transitions. I would just put all the probabilities of transitions one. It means that if I'm in state one, I will definitely go to state three. If I'm Philly, I'm definitely gonna see Sarp. If I'm in um, state two, this is Brooklyn, I'm definitely gonna see Mani. Now, if I'm in uh, three, which is Sarp, uh, then I'm definitely going to have food. And if uh, I'm visiting money, I'm in a state that I'm visiting money, I'm definitely going to have music, okay? So that's just a matrix representation uh, of what's going to happen um, in the world, but one step at a time. Model base uses this and rolls it up. Now, this is what the successor representation looks like. I'd like to, the aficionados, please take a look at this. It's beautiful. It's that thing again that we always <laughs> deal with. Um, so the successor representation, let's call it M in this case, and let's call the transition matrix T for transition. That's M because, um, um, because Peter Diane called it M. There's no other reason. <laughs> um, okay, so as you can see here, I have a probability. So, so this is no longer probability of transition. This is expected future occupation. So this is discounted expected future occupation. So let's say that I expect to visit state three when I'm in state one, uh, discounted, I expect to see it gamma times. I expect to see two, um, uh, to see four when I'm in state two, gamma times. Now five would be gamma squared. Now this can be multiplied by other things like the sort of, uh, we just took the simpler case, right? So here's the thing, because gamma is between zero and one, these things would be smaller than these ones. However, when I ask you, is there a path between one and five, you immediately can say yes. Why is that? Because you have that one to five cell over here. But in this case, you don't. You have to say, wait a second, let me roll things out and then get back to you, right? So that's the difference. That's the successor representation. And if you remember the cat centrality or you remember the given Newman algorithm, you would remember that there was a similar sort of thing going on here. So there's a way that you can turn this guy into that guy. And that way is like this. 
and it says from time step zero to time step infinite, and don't worry about the infinite part because we have a gamma, and that's exponentially decaying, so it's not really going to go to infinity as long as gamma is not one. If it is, then your horizon is infinity, your God, basically, your Leibniz is God, which doesn't exist. But um, in, <laughs> in this case, uh, the as long as gamma is not one, you're going to be uh, it, something less than Leibniz is God. So, uh, and you're going to have, uh, and at, at the limit, because of the gamma, it sort of converges to this. And you can have a successor representation built of T like that. All right, now how, to, how can we test which one does the brain use just using behavior without looking under the hood? And we're going to do that too. But how can we test it just with behavior? Can we design experiments to just test different kind of um, representations? So model-based, one-step transition matrix, successor representation, multi-step expected future occupancy, discounted. Um, remember these things? There are varieties of tasks that could distinguish it, in fact. And here we are in a situation where it happens in the world, but I'm going to experimentally design it because I want to make sure I understand the difference between two algorithms that your brain might be using. One is called reward evaluation, which is if all of a sudden money starts to play only heavy metal music, depends which kind, I might not hang out with him for music anymore. It, it would devalue. If it's 1975, like, I don't know, Rainbow, that's OK. But like, if it goes into 80s, no. <laughs> and then in this case, Sarv might just, uh, so in this case, this is devalued, right? So the value of this is lower now. Now I should always prefer this, so I should change my preference all of a sudden. Let's say before I preferred the music in Brooklyn. Another thing that could happen is that Manny decides to become a chef, and he's not good at it because he just started. Uh, but let's say that he becomes a good chef. But, and Sarf starts to play music. That's a transition revaluation. So we didn't really change the rewards. Let's assume Mani's as good a cook. Uh, we didn't really change the rewards, but the transitions changed. So I no longer, if I go to Philly, I'm no longer going to end up in food. I'm going to end up in music because these transitions have changed, right? Notice that I'm not taking you from the cities. I'm just like telling you or something. So you don't have the experience of going to Philly and playing music. You have the experience of going to Philly and eating good food, right? So you haven't directly experienced. And um, for those of you uh, who are into model three, model three can't learn unless things happen to it directly. So what happens? We did that in an experiment. So we exactly did that thing. I, it wasn't my friends. The stimuli were different. And so there was some kind of reward structure. You would choose between them. You, you probably had to, you know, if you, one of the learning criteria was that you would learn to choose this one as opposed to this one. And then in, we would test you to figure out that you understand correctly what's going on. Then at this phase, which is the relearning phase, we sort of swap the rewards, right? And then in the final phase, we ask you again, do you want to go to one or two? So remember, every time you were at one, you got more rewarded. But here, because of the new information that you learned, you should update what was going on uh, when I drop you back into one, right? So when I drop you back in Princeton and you're very hungry, you should no longer go to Philly. You should not go to Brooklyn. OK? And the other transition was, the, like, I t like I said, the rewards didn't change. But the, the, the friends of mine, they just swapped where they, what they were doing, right? So this time, if I was hungry, I could still get that 10 bucks um, from food. But it would only, but this time, it will be in, I would have to choose Brooklyn for it, because it's going the other way, right? So there's two things that happened. One thing was. Um, uh, two conditions that happened. One condition was rewards got changed, the value of rewards. So you would have to change the trajectory you prefer. The other case, the transition structure of the world changed. So you will have to change the, the preference you had. And we also have a control because maybe you know, our results would be because people just forgot what they did before and they randomly chose something else. So that's a very important condition. All right, now let's see what would happen in each of them. What would we expect to get out of it before I show you what the humans do? So the successor representation would say, hey, at the moment of decision, I'm going to multiply my cached re multi-step representations by the vector of rewards. And then I will get the expected value of state one, which is gamma squared $10. The expected value of state two is gamma squared dollars, which means that in this case, I should choose state one. Now, in the revaluation condition, what has changed is that the vector of rewards has changed. These guys haven't changed. So we get the same thing. Uh, we get a good prediction. And then based on that, by combining pre-computed information about representations in the space and uh, reward, without any further computation, we have immediately the reward evaluation. Right? 
So model predictions, um, model-based, and success representation are both very good at reward evaluation. They perform equally well. Okay. Now, what about transition evaluation? Now, remember that in transition evaluation, you figure out that these things have been swapped. For the model, for the model base, it just changes these two things to these two things. But the successor representation, although it updates these two things, it can't update these two things because it needs to go back to one in order to be able to update those, right? So it still has this past multi-step representation that it had associated Brooklyn with, food, uh, with music and et cetera. What happens is that the pure successor representation won't do well on transition revaluation, but model base would do equally well on both. So we would have symmetric versus asymmetric predictions based on these two different kinds of representation just from the behavior, right? Now, model three, who just says, oh, left, good, right, bad, but doesn't have any idea about state space, and it needs so much training to update itself, it's just going to fail at both. Multi-step expected rewards like success representation is going to be asymmetric and model base is going to be symmetrically good. However, there is this thing called um, SR, the, you know, what I have, I, I, I add replay to everything because I think it's one of the awesomest things in the world. So there is this notion of Dyna algorithms and Dyna algorithms, you use simulated experience to train your models. So although you didn't get the chance to completely go over, uh, and this can be used to train model free as well. So traditionally, this has been in DynaQ, it has been used to train model free, okay? Because model free takes so long, and we might die if we just constantly require all that experience to update our models. Offline simulations through memory replay can help the model free to update. But another thing that it can help update is the successor representation. So it could, uh, and, and there is another paper uh, that I will talk about. I presented it at SEMS for those of you who were there, but it's, hope it's being submitted very soon, like next week. Um, uh, it could also update, like, you know, dream or like, you know, sort of uh, uh, replay this and show that there is uh, sort of the update is multi-step representations. In which case we would still, sometimes it should not f do well, right? It needs to do some extra work for this. So to the extent that it does the offline replay right, we would expect that it's still asymmetric, but it's non-zero. All right, we have our predictions. We know which one is my favorite model. And now let's see what humans did. Boom. So as you can see, control is very close to no revaluation. And revaluation score is how much you preferred one state at, uh, at, at test after learning and how much you preferred it at the final state after revaluation had happened, right? You, you sort of subtract those scores, you get the magnitude of revaluation. As you can see, there is asymmetry that is not predicted by model base learner that stores just T and only one step transitions. So this, it, this means that the fact that they're like non-zero, it means that it's not just model free. Let's throw that off off the bat. Uh, but it's also not model based because there is a significant difference there. We replicated this in other studies too, which I might show you a little bit of. Also, it's not just the accuracy and RT trade-off, because as a matter of fact, they were even slower in the case of the uh, transition, and there was a positive correlation between success at transition revaluation and the amount of time they took. So it's not just that they were less careful about transition or they took less time. So this is not a trade-off either. In fact, they needed extra work to get transition right, which could be this kind of iterations that they would need to do, offline or online. So at the end of the day, these are uh, the results of our sort of, uh, this just got accepted in na uh, Nature Human Behavior. No. We sent the proof. So it's impressed at Nature Human Behavior. Um, so this would be the predictions of model base, the predictions of success representation only, the prediction of SR Dyna or combi uh, combining SR and MB, that would work well too, which would look like uh, the one that fits the data the most. Okay, that was experiment one, and that was, we passively took people around. Uh, Jin did this heroic act of collecting, I don't know, 100 people or more. And so it was an amazing uh, tour de force of testing a lot of different graphs. Uh, all of the whiteboards at the PNI were filled with graphs at that time as well, until we figured out the right paradigm. And Evan did another experiment where there was less trials, so we had less power, but we had more participants and um, uh, they could actively explore. And we replicated the results and even stronger. Um, I won't have time to get into it. Uh, I do recommend reading the paper. We had another paper. I'm not going to get into it either because it's more computational. We extended the SR Dyna to show that it can solve larger scale problems. Various problems, you probably remember, you saw similar sort of maps in Matt's talk. So very similar to mazes that you put rats through. 
we can uh, sort of have RL agents that solve different problems and figure out what algorithm best fits the data. Um, and you know, SR Dyna is uh, the winner um, so far for all of these things that we had. So just to say a little bit about replay, there is this other uh, study that we did with fMRI that show, to show that offline replay actually supports planning. So the stuff that you replay, the content of your replay during these sort of planning period, during these offline rest periods does matter for your behavior later on. And it looks something like this. By now, this kind of structure should be familiar to you, right? So you would end up, for instance, in a theater in Berlin. You could go left to the break room or right to the district room, and then you would explore two different cash sort of cashiers to steal money. We told people that they were thieves and they had to find money, and that motivated Princeton students massively, and they performed way better. So if you ever have an experiment, tell people they are bad, and then they would love it. So here, there were three rest periods during the relearning phase. So it's very similar to what I showed you before, right? The only difference is that a couple of things that you would see, there would be three rest periods, and then you would be asked for the test again. Also, you were exploring the world actively. So the structure was like this. You would see this thing. You would choose up or down. You would get somewhere. You would go left or right and get rewarded. And as such, you would learn what's going on with the graph of the world. Then in the relearning phase, you will not be thrown in the first state. You will be thrown into the, you know, one of the sort of rooms. And then there will be three rest periods intermittent in between the relearning phase. That's when we are doing the decoding, right? That's the important part. And then there is a test phase uh, at the end where I throw you back here and I don't give you feedback. And I just want to see how reliably you're going up or down in the initial state and in other states. And this is important that I'm not giving you feedback because I don't want you to know if your answer was right. I just want to make sure how sure you are. And instead of asking you how sure you are, I give you the choice four times. If you're very sure, you're going to do the same thing. All right. So. This was the structure. We had the revaluation sort of scenario where the rewards swapped. So the room with the most rewards sort of changed. And we had the control condition where nothing changed and everything was the same. And um, these uh, sort of, OK, so first of all, behavior. So you can see that in the control versus, again, control is around 0. And revaluation is uh, sort of uh, very significantly above chance. And if you look at the distribution of the data here in these violin plots and the paired sort of comparisons, it's pretty consistent. Uh, however, uh, the noise that we have in this data is very cool because it allows us to see if the replay that participants showed within these periods would correlate with this kind of variation or distribution that we have, right? So here, I'm going to just show you because I didn't want to get into too much detail. I'm going to stop after this. So during these periods, uh, there's 15 TRs. I have trained a classifier. Everybody's familiar with MVPA, so I didn't see any reason to put more slides there. Train a classifier on scene selective regions and test it on TRs during the rest period. And I just look at evidence for scene, right? And I do it also on the face selective region, or RI, and I look at evidence for faces. So this allows me to a little bit decorrelate them so I can have both high evidence for faces and high evidence for scenes. And that's important, that they're not competing with each other. Okay? Um, so I, I take all of that, and I will put that as an average on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, I will have the revaluation score of the people for the rest periods of control runs, rest periods of revaluation runs. I see not, so that's, half, that's good. Here we go. So for the control condition, we don't have a very positive, very sort of significant correlation between uh, the distribution of the uh, replay of that initial state, the state one, that you're not seeing during phase two, right? And that's crucial. During this phase two, you're not seeing the scene, right? So I look at how much during these rest periods the sceniness of your um, replay is predictive of the extent to which later at this phase you're going to do the right thing. You have updated your representations, right? Yes. Well, there is nothing that is different to reinstate it like this. May I consider that a philosophical question and come back to it after I finish my slides? Because um, reinstatement and replay are close siblings. The whole thing is offline, online thing. So. So if it was reinstatement, also, you wouldn't see it correlated with the opposite of what was going on. So I will talk about this a little bit more after I explain those results. 
So here is the distribution of the uh, replay during this race period. Importantly, it's not different on average from the kind of uh, the amount of replay that you had in this other one, but it is correlated with what, with how much you are replanning, you're replanning, or you are changing your behavior at the late stage. Okay. Now, um, because I want to finish, I'll come back to that point again later, the philosophical point. Okay. What does the successor? Why does the successor representation matter, or this offline replay? Now, this is the part where I sort of uh, go into the last part of my talk and like, the concluding slides. I think that there are some general pr principles for memory organization that the successor representation and replay can give us information about. And that's that there are multi-scale representations and generalizations that the brain is building during experience and during offline replay, that uh, the scaling parameters um, are adaptive to the statistical structures of the world, it has to do with volatility. You heard Arias say something about it, but this is a little bit more model-based than his, ac uh, his account. And then that the hippocampal and prefrontal cortex hierarchy reflect these different sort of kinds of uh, levels of abstraction. So um, these studies that you have here, they all showed some evidence of successor representation or other. A computational one, Sam Gershman did, that they um, suggested that the TCM, temporal context model, can be sort of conceptualized at TCM. Uh, Alex Solway uh, replicated the, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Ari Weinstein uh, replicated Alex Solway's results uh, showing that sub goal planning can happen using the successor representation as opposed to other ways. Uh, uh, Kim Stackenfeld, this is now, this now is in uh, Nature and Neuroscience, it's accepted, so they're sending it soon for uh, the proofs and everything. Uh, showed that actually the hippocampus, the rodent hippocampal data, can be uh, sort of uh, simulated using the successor representation. Uh, Anna Shapiro, in a supplementary figure, she has this results where the right inferior frontal gyrus uh, behaves the way that the successor representation would do in this graph, again, non-spatial. And then these are the stuff that I showed you about our work. And very recently, beautiful fMRI work came out of the Tim Barron's lab that they also showed that the successor representation uh, reflects how the hippocampus is representing a structure that they had learned implicitly and they didn't know that they're going to be tested on the structure of the world. So the brain was building the structure while you were just navigating some things without knowing that there was a structure to it. And later when you were tested on it, your brain reflected a particular kind of representation. So where does the su successor representation live? So um, we're working on it. But the idea is that uh, the PFC and hippocampus, they start sort of working together to build it. And once it gets consolidated, it might be sort of stored in lateral um, uh, sort of temporal and parietal regions. And it can be retrieved when necessary. So it, it basically becomes semantic memory. But then it can be retrieved whenever I'm in a relevant context and reinstated in the hippocampus and PFC. So it's accessible for, uh, in, you know, for uh, operation in the sort of the intermediate term while I'm in that environment. And that might be how, if you go to your childhood house, you, you know exactly where you're going and, you know, or if you go to some building that, so I have been in this hotel like once before and when I came back, I knew exactly where everything was. This wasn't constantly my PFC and hippocampus active, but it was somewhere consolidated and I could just retrieve it and then it was active and I could very easily search through the space to find out where I wanted to go. And the striatum is quite important in this too because it helps tag the memories when you experience something that uh, uh, is surprising, something that violated my prediction, something that had a prediction error. And the whole sort of the replay project, I didn't get into details to it. I would love to get into more details. It has like five other figures of breaking down every rest period, explaining how it differs at every sort of uh, when it receives prediction errors, et cetera. And remember the gamma that I told you about? So the idea is the larger this gamma gets, the brain is integrating or generalizing or abstracting over time scales or cognitive space. And the smaller it gets, uh, you're separating, you're becoming specific, you're sort of being in a, a lower scale or fine grain time scale. And uh, the idea is that the brain at the same time stores multiple ones of these things. And these would be the multiple gammas. And the steps into the future that you can predict or plan, which you could say it's the discounted scope of your agency in a way, in a particular environment, would, determine, um, would be determined by this kind of gamma. Because the more volatile an environment is, um, 
it could be that the, lar the smaller your sort of uh, 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 scale would be and the less, uh, uh, the more uh, larger scales you have. During learning, you might be learning with some scales, but offline replay also allows you to just like replay the experience and build representations at other scales. And while I'm sleeping is a great time to do this. We have some evidence about the role of sleep in generalization and integration. So it would be wonderful to um, simulate some of these effects and test them further as we are doing one of them hopefully in the hackathon. And like I said, it could be that stability and the volatility of the world or my estimation of it is going to sort of drive this up and down. All right? Um, there could be an optimal horizon for situations. So just to take the, the take home message is that there is a relationship between hippocampus um, uh, and the PFC and the striatum to build them and update them and store them in the long term and term proprietor regions. It gives te testable hypothesis and it's related to some work found in the Dollar lab by Per Setterberg in the Hassan lab and by previous work that I did during my PhD about the prefrontal hierarchy. So uh, I'm kind of sort of uh, uh, very, and also in these numbers of studies below, so I'm kind of sort of uh, very optimistic about the future of this research and I'm excited about it. Uh, in ongoing work that I won't get to talk about a lot, we show that you can construct time or cognitive distance using multi-scale representations. So um, if I want to say it in a nutshell in one sentence, it could be that there is no really, there is no time, you just build it using sort of a, a derivative of multi-scale representations. In a way, uh, I won't get into that, just like the big picture claim is representations are not especially about space, they're not especially about time. They are multi-scale relational representations that have different, that represent uh, relations between things and structures at different levels. And um, they are cognitive maps of any relational structure, basically. And the brain can construct co cognitive, various notions of cognitive, cognitive distance, including time, from these multi-scale representations. Thank you. We have a few quick questions for Ida, and then she's also up to the round, so we have plenty of time to talk. <laughs> yes, we got No question is silly. Thank you. Uh, so uh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> Other than looks. <laughs> Which study exactly? Because they don't have anything that's that multi-step. Right. I mean, like, I mean, things like the Elliot Wimmer science study. Right? So Elliot Wimmer, and it comes back to the question that was asked about reinstatement versus not. In Elliot Wimmer's case, you have reinstatement while somebody is seeing the other thing. Right. It's not when they are offline, and it's not something that they hadn't seen recently. So it's a little different in his case. So we know that both online reinstatement of memories and offline replay can help with learning. Now the idea is in which case, which one is optimal. In Elliot Wimmer's case, there is way less uncertainty about the world. In our case, especially in the more uncertainty, I didn't show you we have different conditions, one has more uncertainty. Uh, you don't receive exactly the same reward, you, you receive it from a distribution that has a fixed mean. And that means there is some kind of expected uncertainty. In that condition, offline replay benefits you way more than in the condition when you don't have certainty. In Elliot Wimmer's condition, there is no uncertainty, so I'm guessing just the reinst and also you're looking at the picture. So just by reinstating the associate, uh, one step associate of the picture you're looking at, you can solve the problem. So it's not a comparable problem to the space. Would that also be true of Brad Dahl's study? Yes. Well, yes. Also, Brad Dahl shows that there is prospective representations of one step ahead. It's just one step again. And it's also a wonderful study that I absolutely love. And you know, Nathaniel is a co-author on all of these papers. But uh, you see that there, the, and also in the other work that I did on the perspective mem on perspective memory, what we are decoding there, is it somewhere uh, here? So we are decoding uh, what tasks you're gonna do in 15 seconds. But at a hierarchical level of task sequences, this is one step away, right? So although this is 30 seconds later and I'm gonna see so many stimuli in the meantime, I do so many things, I would still not consider this as sophisticated as in this other case. Yes. So I'm surprised that the uh, question raised about the reinstatement of the 
live? Um, so this matrix that I showed you, um, so these matrix, uh, one second, I just want the comparison here. So these matrices, so Tolman's idea would have been that the hippocampus stores something like the one on the left. And this idea that we have is in fact that the hippocampus, while we're learning in the world, is representing something like that. And my broader idea is that not only does it represent one of them, but like this image that I kind of skipped pretty fast, along the long axis of the hippocampus and uh, possibly the PFC, you will have multiple ones of these things and um, they will have different scales of representation. So in a manner of speaking, um, yeah, so they will have more gamma as you go more anterior perhaps, also in the hippocampus. Um, there is some evidence that you have larger sensitivity to larger receptive fields, larger structures. This is the ventral for rodent people and um, longer time scales. So it's not that I think it's just, a, so it's not just an algorithm, but it's a particular kind of matrix that algorithms that use the SR could use. So it's a claim, it's a kind of a claim about what kind of representations the hippocampus builds and uses. And I think that at larger scales, these things, um, you know, at, at larger and multi scales, they turn into, they can be representing schema. For instance, oh, you know, airport, I do such and such, and then I uh, shorter scales. I have to stand in line on shorter scales. I, you know, take out my passport. This is a passport. And shorter scales. Passport means I have nationality. Now we're getting into sad uh, ba travel ban space. So that, you see what I mean? So I do think that it's the way that representations in, across neurons are organized inside the brain. Online. Totally agree. It's like brain space is kind of decluttering, mm -hmm. but it doesn't feel the sensation like I do stay, like the initial state. Yeah. Can I ask you something now? Uh, could I finish? I, I, may I ask you first? Uh, so let's say that this was just the reinstatement of state one, exactly the way it was without replaying the sequence as I'm claiming, because I'm claiming that it's replaying the sequence from state one and it's updating. Then wouldn't you expect that it would do exactly what it was doing in the state one? Just a, yes or no? So I'm going to repeat what I said because it's the same answer. The, if it was reinstating exactly so, initially I used to go to Brooklyn for music. If I was just reinstating, oh, Brooklyn music, Brooklyn, or right, you know, the train, to, train to New York music, train to New York music, which is the action from state one and the reward. I was just reinstating Princeton, train to New York, right? Princeton, train to New York, that's the good stuff. I was just reinstating that. Then I should be still, still taking that at the test phase. But if I was saying Princeton, train to New York, no longer music. Oh, Princeton, train to Philly music, then I should be taking the other way. And the evidence, because of the fact that they're changing their behavior, it shows that they weren't just reinstating whatever was happening just in state one in the past, but they're reinstating the trajectory, piecing together early information that there is a path from one to Philly and the new information that Philly is the one leading to music now. So the fact that we do see this behavioral difference, the fact that we do see the correlation. So if you were, what you were saying was the case, we should have seen either a flat line or we should have seen it go this way, which is be even more consistent, persist on what I was choosing earlier because I was only reinstating state one. But behavioral evidence shows that I'm not doing what I was doing in state one. I'm doing something that only would be possible if I put state one next to the new information I had recently acquired, which was not available when I last visited state one. And so this shows that I was, pro I mean, it, it's an inference, but the inference is that there must have been a sequential piecing together of information for me to update my state one behavior. I see you not, so that's great. <laughs> Maybe uh, we'll wrap up and keep talking this over lunch. <laughs> Do you think I had it one more time?